I despise cancer. This disease took the life of my mother's mom, my grandma, when I was eight years old. It took the life of my father's baby sister, devastating his parents, who were both physicians. Later in life, his brother, and most impactful, my wife's mother, the grandma of my children. I know that many of you in this room and online have had families impacted by cancer. And so you'd be right to ask, why have we not solved this problem? I spent most of my career at a National Cancer Institute uh, facility on an Army base. That's because President Nixon uh, ended the U.S. biowarfare program and gave those resources to the war on cancer. An amazing uh, decision by a world leader, but the war on cancer, I think, is kind of the wrong analogy. A tumor is our, our very own cells, and so to fight a war against ourselves probably doesn't work. The current analogy is the cancer moonshot. This is better, to send astronauts to the moon and bring them back took an amazing investment, multi-year technology development, but we knew where the moon was. We knew how far away it was. We could calculate what it would take to get there and back. It was a known problem. Cancer is not a known problem. Cancer is more like a puzzle that has to be solved before you can have a rational solution. But it's like one of these puzzles where every piece is the same color and the same shape, and it seems impossible. Worse than that, any cell type in your body that's dividing can form a tumor. So we're talking about literally hundreds of puzzles that each need to be solved. We've solved some. Most children with pediatric leukemia can be cured, and I've seen this technology transferred to Guatemala and Nicaragua to benefit their children. My grandmother died of breast cancer. Since 1990, we've steadily cut the mortality rate of breast cancer in half, almost exclusively because of improved therapy based on knowledge of the tumor, uh, of how to kill breast tumor cells. We figured out the causes, nearly all the causes of cancer. This started in the great city of London by Sir Percival Pott, who identified that chimney sweeps were exposed to chemicals Causing, uh, causing cancer. And since then, we've identified the chemicals, viruses, radiation, smoking, uh, and genes that cause hereditary cancer. But what all these things have in con common? What are all these diverse agents causing the same disease? A big clue came from the study of nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, it's an inherited disease where people get uh, hundreds of basal cell carcinomas. Uh, we were part of an international team uh, that set out to clone the gene, and after years of laborious positional cloning, we found the gene on chromosome 9. It turned out to be the human homologue of a very important gene identified in Drosophila that is involved in embryonic development, and if it's misexpressed, it causes uh, abnormal wings in this case. Patched is the receptor for a set of signaling proteins called hedgehogs, and it's at the front of this pathway. Uh, all these genes are critical to embryonic development, but one by one, hedgehog was found to be an oncogene, so was smoothin, so was glee. Patched, obviously, was a tumor suppressor, so was SUFU. So the pathway critical to embryonic development is also critical to cancer. What does that tell us? All the agents that cause cancer cause chronic tissue damage and inflammation over years or decades. And this results that stem cells in the normal tissue have to divide to repair that damage. Every time any cell divides, it makes about 100 mistakes. If a stem cell makes mistakes, it accumulates those errors. And over time, one can get uh, mutations in oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, go from normal to pre-malignant to primary tumor. And we've worked out this pathway for most of the major cancer types. But as I'll tell you in a minute, that was the easy part. Our lab is focused on cervical cancer, which is caused exclusively by human papillomavirus. In the e England and the US, uh, countries with lots of money, there's almost no mortality because we have screening and prevention strategies. But you can see that the mortality climbs geometrically as income goes down. 
And there are disparities in every country. Tragically, older African-American women have the same mortality as some of the poorest women in the world. We established a cervical cancer study in Guatemala so we could study this disease in a low-income country. And this amazing team recruited over 700 women. They were consented, uh, given consent form, and tumor and blood samples collected. Um, HPV is a double-stranded virus. Uh, it uh, replicates in the nucleus as an episome and contains two powerful oncogenes. It often integrates into the genome, and those integrations uh, can be complicated. For the last two years, we've used this little beast uh, to study this problem. I love that it's the size of the Swiss Army knife I had as a kid. Last year at this meeting, Nicole Rossi from my group presented ultra-long read sequencing of uh, phenomenally long concatamers that we still don't know the full size of, of, of HPV sequences, composed of full-length genomes shown as the A, a specific 1.3 KB deleted genome shown as B, and smaller fragments that are X. Those A's and B's are all identical, but you can see the order in which they're arranged is different at different integration sites. We reason the only way that could happen is if those concatamers form before integration as extra chromosomal DNA, and we term that phenomenon HPV superspreading. Nicole went on to try to find that intermediate, that uh, uh, episomal intermediate, and characterized an amazing cell line, SNU1000, that has only episomal HPV. And by using transposons, we could find individual circles, the monomers, uh, dimers, and multimers of full-length HPV, but also found a different deleted version of the virus that was rearranged again in this sort of scrambled fashion. And we went on to show that in actual cervical tumors, you find these rearranged uh, multimers. Uh, Thomas Reed's lab at the NCI did in situ hybridization for us, and this is HPV signal, and you see these enormous blobs of DNA. These are the largest fragments of HPV that have ever been seen, uh, I think, in any cell. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. I told you that the easy part was understanding how we get to the primary tumor. That's because virtually all cancer patients die of metastatic disease or therapy-resistant tumors, and we understand fairly little about this process. We know that it's not specific genes. They're typically not specific genes mutated in, in metastatic tumors or most therapy-resistant tumors. An important clue has come from work that our lab and others have done over the last 10 years, identifying a whole new class of genes mutated in cancer. These are genes that encode enzymes, that modify histones, that remodel chromatin, that uh, regulate splicing or methylation. And why then, why then do cancers seem to require some gene involved in regulating the epigenome to be mutated? My theory is that if you go back to embryology, uh, animals start as a fertilized egg, becoming an embryo, a fetus, and then develop hundreds or thousands of specialized cell types. Except for B cells and T cells, all of those cells have exactly the same DNA as the fertilized egg. How does that happen then? How do we get hundreds or thousands of cell types with all different functions? All by regulating the epigenome, by turning on or turning off different programs of gene expression. If we parallel that onto a cancer cell or a tumor stem cell that has mutated genes in its epigenome, it has the ability to unlock all of those pathways of survival. And so if a tumor cell is running out of oxygen, it turns on angiogenesis and grows new blood vessels. If it gets too crowded, it turns on migratory pathways and metastasize. All of the cells in our body are resistant to our own immune system. Cancer cells are turning on those same properties to avoid the immune response. So we need to understand in detail then how are the enzymes that package chromatin modified, how are cancer cells uh, mutating epigenetic genes, and what, what are the consequences of that? So 
So we went back to our little device here uh, and began first with direct cDNA sequencing, where full-length RNA is copied into a double-strand DNA, and then both strands uh, have adapters and can be sequenced. We applied that to a panel of 20 HPV-positive cervical and head and neck cell lines and got unprecedented detail on the expression of HPV. And the top is Caskey cells, that cell that had hundreds of copies of HPV. It turns out only one of the six or 800 copies in that genome are expressed. All the other copies are silent. And even though there are about 20 different isoforms that H HPV can produce, only essentially one uh, makes up the majority of transcripts producing the E7 oncogene. That other cell line, SNU-1000, again, with, with uh, hundreds or thousands of copies in the cell of episomal HPV, also makes only essentially two transcripts, mostly producing E7. So the virus is regulating its epigenome to produce what it needs, which is its most important oncogene uh, later in, in life. We've studied how uh, integration of HPV affects uh, expression. HPV can integrate inside genes, disrupting them. And then often genes nearby are turned on, in this case, a transcription factor called FOXE1. When we looked across our 20 cell lines, every single one has a gene highly expressed near the integration site. And these include oncogenes, DNA repair genes, and transcription factors that are probably playing some role in the transformation process. Uh, to look more in detail at this, uh, we can see that Foxy one is overexpressed, but it's, not, it's mostly not full-length transcripts. It's all kinds of crazy, uh, alternately spliced transcript. And there's a region downstream of the gene that's uh, also transcribed very highly, which in all normal cells is normally not expressed. So we wanted to look at how the methylation is affected by integration. Uh, we validated, as, as many of you have, that by bisulfide sequencing, the nanopore sequencing gives you highly accurate uh, methylation. But the beauty of this is we can see every CPG site across the HPV genome on individual viral genomes. And we see in Caskey cells much more methylation. That makes sense because most of those copies are silent. Uh, then in SNU-1000, it has less uh, methylation. In that site of integration near FOXE1, we see massive demethylation not only on top of the FOXE1 gene, but on the region next door uh, where there's also transcription of RNAs that we don't know what they're doing, uh, but they are there. We then turn to direct RNA sequencing. Here is where RNA uh, is copied. You make a DNA copy, but that's just to provide a template to put a sequencing adapter onto the end, and it's the RNA that goes through the pore and gets sequenced. The advantage of this, you're directly sequencing the molecule. There's no bias or artifacts from reverse transcription. You can identify uh, RNA modifications like 6-methyladenine. You can determine the precise size of the poly A tail, which helps determine RNA stability and is a, a determinant of regulation. We applied this to HeLa cells, the only cell line with its own New York Times bestseller. Uh, and you can see these HPV transcripts are all here in pink. They're all pink because these are all forward reads. So they're all going in one direction. Uh, the soft-clipped or multicolored uh, fragments are aligning to the human genome to chromosome 8. Uh, in HeLa cells, HPV 18 is uh, integrated near the MYC oncogene, activating it. And we can see that. We can see this enormous expression of the MYC oncogene, uh, much higher than even other uh, cancer cell lines. I did my PhD studying the regulation of the MYC oncogene never imagining that I would directly see RNA transcripts. Now, we'd like to translate our work, though, into the clinic. We and others have shown that the most frequently mutated uh, human gene in cervical cancer is PIK3CA. It's a kinase at the head of a signaling pathway. And there's an FDA-approved small molecule drug that's approved for some breast cancer indications that targets that protein. When we take some of our cell lines with the pathway activated, micromolar levels of the drug completely block their proliferation. They also turn down the expression of HPV, and interestingly, they turn down the protein of PDL1. PDL1 is a protein that can inhibit T cells from killing a cell, and tumor cells will turn this uh, protein on to uh, block the immune response, and it's a major target of immunotherapy. 
So we think this drug might not, not only uh, suppress the proliferation of cervical tumor cells that have the pathway activated, but turn off immunosuppressive molecules and make immune therapy more effective. And we're working with a local uh, corporate partner uh, to carry this forward. We also can show by barcode uh, transcriptome that uh, those treated cells have RNA expression of HPV reduced and expression of a number of immune genes, HLA, and genes that induce uh, uh, interferon. Now, the epigenome is not a, a linear thing. It's, it's uh, packed into the genome in three dimensions, and there are three-dimensional interactions that we need to understand. So we've used the PORC method to cross-link DNA, digest it, ligate the ends together, and then sequence those fragments. Uh, we applied that to this cell line, a CHA cell, which has two copies of HPV embedded into uh, scrambled fragments of human genome, and we can see that most of the interactions between HPV and those human fragments are happening in the enhancer region. So this is consistent with the idea that HPV brings in an enhancer. If there are multiple enhancers, it can form a super enhancer and interact with other genes nearby or even on other chromosomes. Then the energetics of cancer cells is dramatically altered. Otto Warburg showed in the, in the 30s uh, that cancer cells switch from metabolizing glucose in the mitochondria to keeping that molecule in the cytoplasm, converting it to lactate. And it's been an open question ever since then, what is the role of the mitochondria in cancer? We have new ways to study this. From our nanopore sequencing, we get full-length reads across the whole 16 KB mitochondrial genome. We'll be able to look for mutations. We can look at methylation. In general, there's very little methylation of the mitochondrial genome, but you can see there are some sites this may be interesting uh, to look into. And from our direct RNA sequencing, we can count up precisely the number of transcripts of each of the mitochondrial uh, genes and the ribosomal RNA uh, that's a mitochondrial. So, in summary, we've used uh, long-read sequencing to characterize simple and complex integrations. We've shown that there are cervical tumors with uh, monomer episomes that form cancer by epigenetically altering their regulation to turn on E6 and E7 oncogenes. Uh, these episomes can also form multimers and rearrange multimers um, that need to be further studied. And then we've demonstrated multiple methods where multiple approaches where we can study how the regulation of epigenetics is altered in cancer. Um, and uh, along with Vanessa Porter's talk that you heard yesterday, you've seen how long read sequencing is helping us understand more about cervical cancer. And we hope this inspires other groups to take these approaches to study other cancer types so that we can solve the puzzle of these other cancers and benefit the families across the world. Here's the amazing team, which is not a big team, uh, that did all of this work. Uh, other collaborators uh, at the NCI in Guatemala and uh, Venezuela. I'd like to thank Mona Lina Binney and Jessica Anderson from uh, ONT who helped us with technical support. And we've also had uh, help from Seven Bridges Genomics. I'd like to end with a challenge to the community can we develop an inexpensive point of care or relatively rapid HPV detection device? This is essential to eliminating cervical cancer in low and, and middle income countries. And I'm happy to say that I've already had uh, conversations with people here yesterday about this, and I hope that we'll be able to report back at the next London Calling that this is working. Thank you very much. <laughs>